Modern forestry has a problem, and that problem is trails. During a timber harvest, logs have to be moved from the forest to the roadside so they can then be delivered to mills and turned into the lumber that builds our homes. But these trails can be doing catastrophic damage to your forest and your potential returns. Now, harvest trails aren't exactly a new phenomenon, and in fact, they aren't even necessarily a problem. After all, without them, timber couldn't be harvested. But they do represent an age-old battle between silviculture and engineering. You see, when we talk about forest management, which is to say growing quality timber and trying to influence the forest so it grows the way we want it to, that is primarily a silvicultural problem. But silviculture and silvicultural practices usually rest on timber harvesting. And the core problem of timber harvesting is how to sever and move wood. So timber harvesting is primarily an engineering problem. Now the best solution for the engineering side of things isn't always the best solution for the silvicultural side of things. And the best solution for silviculture isn't necessarily the best solution for engineering. And so there's this inherent trade-off between these two principles. The problem comes when engineering is definitively winning that battle. These days we put so much focus into solving those engineering problems that the forest takes a hit. So much of a hit that these trails could be having a negative 40% impact on your forest productivity. Now, first off, let's give credit where credit is due. Trees are massive, hulking, cumbersome things that break things when they fall. And the forest is a labyrinth, not exactly known for accessibility. Added together, it's pretty amazing that timber harvesting is even possible. And yet turning trees into cities was one of mankind's first accomplishments, literally. In the world's oldest written story, the Epic of Gilgamesh, the two heroes of the story, Gilgamesh and Enkidu, have to venture into the giant cedar forest in order to harvest trees to build the gates of the Sumerian city of Nippur. But in order to do so, they have to fight and kill the demon protecting the forest, and only then are they able to harvest the trees. Now you can interpret that how you want to, but the way I see it, in the ancient world timber harvesting was such an incredibly difficult and grueling process that it was mythologized as work reserved for heroes. And of course, over the years, we've been able to invent some astounding mechanisms to make this once mythologized task ever more achievable. And today in the 21st century, we've essentially mastered it with these giant hydraulic behemoths that would have been completely unimaginable just 100 short years ago. And we shouldn't understate how much of an achievement this is. After all, to this day, logging is one of the most dangerous industries. But where we're using feller bunchers and harvesters that have enclosed cabs, this is no longer the case. But this technology has come at a definitive cost, and that cost is trails. As our technology has developed, so too has our reliance on trails. And the reason for this is both physical and economic. Think back, if you will, to the days of horse logging. Back then, cutting every tree was an extremely labor-intensive process. Every tree had to be cut with an ax or cross-cut saw. Moreover, they didn't have the developed and diversified forest product markets we have today. So there was a limited number of trees that could actually be monetized. That means more often than not, they were taking the best and leaving the rest. These conditions led to a substantial cost in trail building. Because when you're building a trail, you have to meticulously clear out every tree. And all that labor isn't necessarily turned into dollar signs because you can't sell the trees that you're harvesting on that trail. And so we know from satellite imagery of horse trails that are still visible, they tended to space these trails out about 500 feet. In between those 500 foot increments, the horses would forward smaller amounts of wood through what would better be described as paths of least resistance. Now, of course, horse logging was practiced all around the world over a very long period of time. So the exact practices differed substantially, but the general idea remained the same. Now in the modern era, the physics and economics of the situation have changed. Feller bunchers can cut a lot of trees really fast, and we have the markets to absorb those trees. So even little trees like this can be harvested and sold relatively profitably. But these machines are incredibly expensive on a per hour basis, unlike the cheap labor of the past. So that means harvests become more game of economies of scale. It makes sense to invest in the overall efficiency of the operation in order to make as much production as possible. That means going in and harvesting more trails to tame the labyrinth of the forest so these machines don't have to fight anything. They just go in and harvest trees. These days we cut more trails. A lot more trails. How many more trails? 
Well, it's obviously going to depend on both the machinery being used and the conditions of the forest itself. But if you're using standard large scale equipment like a feller buncher or a harvester, it's reasonable to expect 80 foot trail spacing edge to edge. And they can certainly be more frequent than that. Now compared to a 500 foot interval, 80 feet seems a lot more frequent. And it is, but it isn't necessarily a problem even then. If we were still using horses, for example, then every trail would still be relatively narrow and the impact would be relatively low. So even if we had a much higher frequency of spacing trails, it wouldn't really matter all that much. But our modern machines are a far cry from horses. They're big, really big, and the trails they travel on necessarily have to be bigger. So a reasonable estimate for the width of a modern trail is about 20 feet, tree to tree. And again, it can go much higher than that, particularly if the operator is a bit sloppy. So if the trail itself is 20 feet wide and the green strip, the space between trails, is 80 feet, that means 20% of our standing volume is removed from trails. 20% of our acreage is effectively removed from timber production and dedicated to the logistics of liquidating timber. 20% of our land is dedicated to solving an engineering problem. Now, if we were to take that at face value, maybe that's a fair trade. After all, without trails, we can't have a timber harvest. The problem is we can't take that at face value. The costs go much further than just that. You see, the trees that are on the edge of these trails, to use some technical jargon, are f They're receiving tremendous amounts of damage both above ground and below ground. As these machines roll through the forest, they're sinking into the soil a little bit. Sometimes it's a lot and it's creating some very bad rutting issues which create a whole other host of problems. But even if it's just a little bit, it's enough to damage and even sever roots, particularly if the trees are shallow rooted. That's going to increase the incidence of rot, it's going to decrease the quality of the internal wood if it's a species that's graded on quality, and it's going to increase mortality as the root damage is going to increase the likelihood of wind throw, which is to say trees being blown down by wind. But then above ground, these trees are taking more damage. You see, there are essentially two types of machines that are moving the logs. There are skidders, which are pulling the whole tree behind them, and as it's pulling them, the branches and logs are rubbing up against the side of trees and removing bark and causing scarring. A forwarder isn't dragging trees, but it's picking up cut logs and putting them into a bunk, and so it's a lot taller. So as it's moving over rocks and roots, it's kind of swinging from side to side, and that swinging can do damage to the residual stems. Now, if these trees are grown and valued on the basis of just volume, such as the case with pulp wood or low-grade saw logs, that's not necessarily a problem. But if we're talking about valuable quality species like sugar maple or black cherry, this is catastrophic to the value. A beautiful veneer tree can receive a bit of damage during a timber harvest and be left with only a fraction of the value it could have had. Now, it's impossible to quantify this exact damage because, again, there are just too many variables. It's going to depend on the type of species, it's going to depend on the machinery used, and probably most of all, it's going to depend on the operator's skill level. But just as a little thought experiment, if we assume that the trees on the edge of these trails have a 20-foot crown diameter, which also correlates to the extent of the root system, then that creates another 20% of effect that the trails have, which brings the total to 40%. That means that the total negative impact of these trails is up to 40% of the entire acreage. And to be honest, in particularly bad situations, that number might even go up to 50. But the total costs still do not end. Now this one is a bit more theoretical, but it's still a real thing. In silviculture, we have the concept of stocking, which is essentially a proxy for how spatially efficient the trees are growing. If a stand is understocked, that means that it could be growing more trees without incurring much of a cost. And in fact, by being understocked, a stand could be incurring costs such as increased mortality from blowdown or increased branchiness, which is limiting the value of the stems. But if a stand is overstocked, then it's growing too many trees, and the growth of each individual tree is cannibalizing the growth of others. So it's not growing as efficiently as if it had less trees on the acreage. That means that when you're doing an intermediate harvest, which means a partial harvest, which is to say a thinning or a selection cut, you have a target for exactly how much of the standing volume you can remove, lest the stand become understocked and start growing inefficiently. So let's say that it's determined that during a free thinning of a hardwood stand, only 40% of standing volume could be removed. 
Well, just like that, 20% is removed just from cutting the trails. Half the volume from that timber harvest is going to be relatively random. It's not going to be targeted towards any specific silvicultural goal, like improving quality or species composition. It's just going to be systematically chosen based on the spacing of those trails. So after those trails are cut, you can only remove, on average, another one out of five trees. Now, of course, the exact percent is going to depend on the age class because bigger trees represent more volume, but you get the idea. You have to look at five trees and pick the worst one to be removed. That severely hampers the effectiveness of the silvicultural operation. And once you account for the additional damage that could be done on the edges of the trails, the entire thing could be at best a wash. And in fact, it's entirely possible that the harvest could be doing more harm than good. If you're aiming to improve quality by removing one out of five trees, but then create damage to one out of five more, what's the point? Now, please understand that this isn't just theory or numbers that I'm just making up. This is real. I've seen this. I've lived this. And actually, I wanted to share an example of a harvest that I visited just this past summer. What's the first thing you notice? Yeah, trails. A lot of them. Probably more than 20%. And guess what I found as I walked this harvest? You guessed it, damage. A lot of stem damage. Now it's important to understand that I did not cherry pick this harvest. And actually one of the things that was so disappointing about this was otherwise this was an amazing harvest. There was real intentionality to the silviculture. They had a clear objective in mind. And the landowner, which is a landowner I very much respect, uh, was trying to do the best thing. Unfortunately, just not enough attention was paid to the trails. And I, I can't really say truthfully that I believe that this is going to do long-term good to the stand. To be honest, they would have been better off just clear cutting the thing or letting it grow. And that really sucks. I've seen this and witnessed this personally too many times and it's created a lot of heartache for me over the years. And actually this was a huge motivating factor for me investing in my own small scale harvesting equipment. I wanted to see what forestry and silviculture could really be if the focus was put on silviculture and the production of the forest itself and only the necessary attention was put on the engineering problems. So I bought this Chinese forwarding trailer so I could maneuver through narrow trails and do as little damage as possible to the overall forest. And while there's still a lot of experimentation to be done, I think the results speak for themselves. This is some aerial footage of my land after a selection harvest. The only trails you can really make out are the trails that were made in previous harvests 30 years ago. This, however, was a selection cut done with a modern feller buncher and grapple skitter. I really cannot wait to monitor the production of these stands over time and see how the economics play out. So I think the core question that remains is, what exactly is the purpose of this video? Why am I telling you this? Am I just trying to discourage you? No, absolutely not. Am I suggesting you go out and buy machinery like mine? It would be cool, but no, certainly not. If only because it's completely impractical for most people, and I'm still in the experimentation phase, so I can't give any clear recommendations. In this video, I'm not even gonna give you any tips and tricks to how to minimize trail damage. That's an incredibly important topic to follow, but to be honest, I could make a two hour video about that, so it's best to do it as a series over time. And also, it's really only going to matter for the people who are actually picking up the chainsaw. So what message do I want to impart on you today? Well, there was a former Toyota industrial engineer by the name of Taichi Ono, and he was almost single-handedly responsible for revolutionizing a lot of the practices in the Japanese auto industry. And one of the things he was big on was making waste visible. He didn't want to hide different ways in which the factory was wasting production. He wanted to make it visible so it could be fixed. And that's my primary purpose today. I want you to be able to conceptually break your forest into front end and back end, short term and long term, right now and in the future. Maybe you want to do a partial harvest on your land. Maybe you're ready to do a thinning or a selection cut or some sort of a partial harvest. And it's possible that maybe you even have bids submitted. Maybe there's one logger that can give you a lot more money than another. I want you to understand 
that that dollar sign represents something very particular. That dollar sign oftentimes is just a reflection of how efficient the operator can liquidate timber. That number has nothing to do with how productive your forest can be. Maybe there's another logger nearby that can't afford to give you that much money, but he uses specialized equipment that can drastically reduce the amount of damage on your forest. Maybe it's even a horse logger. There might even be cases where it makes sense not to take a dividend from a partial harvest if by doing so you can focus as much attention into promoting long-term productivity as possible. And then you can make that money back and then some in the future when you do the final harvest when these concerns aren't as relevant. I did a video a few weeks back about the reasoning why you might want to own young cutover forest land. The core of the argument was essentially that at younger ages you can better influence the trajectory of growth. So the younger a stand is during entry, the more it makes sense to invest in the productivity of the forest, not the logistics of engineering. There's definitely a market for small scale logging out there. And I know that because there have been three people who have approached me to cut their land um, just by me moving my equipment around town. And I haven't done it yet because I'm not a contractor. I just harvest my own land. That might change in the future just for content, to be honest. Um, but it's amazing to me that by not advertising myself and just moving equipment down the road, I can get people that want me to cut their land. But I think this is a market that needs to be developed more nationwide. And part of that development is changing the mindset on how we view our forests. And 90% of that, if not more, is simply breaking things down into front end and back end and calculating them accordingly. And I have other projects on that front, which hopefully you'll be hearing about soon. So that's all for now, guys. Thank you so much for watching this video. This is an issue that's very important for me, and it's an issue that I want to illuminate more. Uh, so I've been wanting to make this video for a long time, so I really hope that you found it valuable. And as always, if you wanna learn more about managing your own forest, and you want an entry-level understanding of silviculture, silvicultural treatments, different types of harvest systems, measurements you take on your forest, and of course, some volume tables that you can use to help estimate volume on your own land, I highly suggest you go to my website in the link below in the description in the comments and download my free ebook, How to Read Your Forest. So I'll let you guys chew on all that a little bit and I'll see you later.